Okay, good morning, everyone. Today is the 25th of September, 2022, and we have our 83rd International English Online Meeting. And today we have a very important round table with four good friends and teachers and professionals and human beings from Colombia. My good friend, Angelica Rojas, uh, Mauricio Arango, Eulises Cordova, and Jose Lobo. Thank you very much, you four for giving us part of your time on a Sunday morning. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, first, let me uh, share my screen with all of you so we can have a, a view of what we are going to do. Okay, this is my, my screen. I want to make it bigger, but okay. This is the 83rd International English uh, Online Meeting. Okay, uh, let's take a moment to reflect. Could you please, Mauricio, read this first and only quote, please, and tell me what you think. Okay, the capacity to learn is a gift. The ability to learn is a skill. The willingness to learn is a choice. What do you think, my dear friend? Mm, let's see. Uh, the capacity to learn a gift. Yeah. The ability to learn a skill. The willingness to learn is a choice that everybody uh, can access to learning, but in this case, motivation is also really important. I mean, if you want to learn something. Yes, so and I, that's- I related that's, with motivation, yeah. Yes, and that's why we are here this morning, right? Because we have the willingness to learn from each other. Okay, who is presenting soon? Uh, on October the 2nd, we will have uh, five friends from uh, Guatemala. They will be talking about the reality and challenges in Guatemala. Then on October the 9th, we'll have four good, excellent friends from Mexico talking about the reality in Mexico. Then uh, Debra Suarez, who is present in Facebook Live now from uh, TESOL, the USA. She will be talking on October the 16th. Then our good new friend, Lorena Ojeda from Argentina, she will be talking on October the 23rd. Uh, five good friends and colleagues from Argentina, uh, they will be talking about the reality of teaching and learning in Argentina on Sunday, October the 30th. Our great, wonderful, marvelous friend from Argentina, Monica Rodriguez Salvo, will be talking to us on November the 6th. And the, uh, one of the best round tables, I guess, we will have on December the 18th, a week before Christmas, uh, the presidents of different English associations in Latin America will be talking to us. If you want to watch uh, all the videos, you can find them in Jaime Kajima Teacher Trainer YouTube channel. Okay, who are the speakers today? Mauricio Arango, sorry, I forgot to change the, the photograph, sorry Gladys. Angelica, Gladys was supposed to be speaking today, but she had some personal issues problems, so she couldn't make it. So let me let me say a few words, uh, please, about our four guests. Uh, Angelica Maria Rojas holds a master's degree in educational sciences with an emphasis on bilingualism. She holds a bachelor's degree in modern languages. She's a translator, editor-in-chief, and director of the Foundation El Faro Publishing House. Uh, she has uh, translated several books of Islamic interest into Spanish and is a representative of her Islamic, of her Islamic commun community in Latin America. Jose Lobo uh, has a BA in education in the teaching of English and Spanish from Universidad del Atlantico. He has an MA in Intercultural Communication from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, and a doctorate in Education, specifically in Literacy in Second Language from the University of Cincinnati. He works at Universidad del Atlantico in Barranquilla, Colombia, and in the Graduate School of Quality Leadership University in Panama City. Mauricio Arango holds a master's in English didactics from the Universidad de Caldas in Manizales, Colombia, 
along with being an EFL teacher at various settings such as language centers, high schools, universities, and social academic projects. He has been part of national and local bilingualism projects. Through his presentations in ELT events, he mainly shares the design, development, and implementation of materials in his classes, as well as strategies used to enhance students' intercultural competence. And finally, my great, wonderful friend, Ulises Cordova Zuniga, is a dedicated, creative, innovative, dynamic, and goal-driven professional teacher with a solid commitment to every child's social and academic growth and development. He holds a PhD in education, uh, sciences, a master in didactics of English, a master, uh, he has experience in primary, sorry, sorry, and a bachelor in English and French education. Oh, vous parlez français aussi. He has experience in primary, secondary, and university institutions. He has received training in numerous professional development courses. Uh, he has 13 years of experience teaching students of all ages and backgrounds, rural, urban, primary, secondary, high school, and university. His philosophy is based on constructivism, humanism, and transformative and experiential learning theories. Thank you once again, dear Angelica, Mauricio, Jose, and Ulises for the time and the expertise you are going to uh, share with us today. And let me say good morning to the president of our institution and association, Raj Gil. Good morning, Raj. Good morning. Nice to be with you all. Thank you, my dear president. Thank you so much. Okay, so we are going to start our beautiful round table with the first question. And oh, Jaime, by the way, I got a, a, a short yeah. warm up. It's going to be only five minutes. Okay, I just, okay. I just, I just prepared it at the 11th hour. <laughs> so, okay, so you want to start now? Sure. Yeah. All right. Before we start with the questions, okay. Exactly. Yeah, I think it's, it's a good idea just to. Okay. Like, so, basically, this, I mean, we're going to keep the same questions. Oh, before going on, I just want to ask you when you see this picture, what do you think about this picture? Where was it taken? Uh, so, I mean, the ideas that uh, you share with us, what do you think about the picture in, in general? Well, well, I love Who the, are they? I, I love the, 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 the colors, mm -hmm. uh, full of colors, very lively photograph, beautiful landscape. I mean, who, who, I mean, who do you think that they are? Uh, I guess they are professors. Teachers? Exactly, exactly. Actually, this is a, a kind of warm up that you can have in your classes with a picture, and and the students uh, keep, uh, can keep asking you questions. Actually, this uh, picture was taken like four years ago in El Eje Cafetero in Colombia. Uh, we have some immersions by the Ministry of Education in La Tebaida, Quindío. So we can see uh, teachers with different colors, and they are they were from all over Colombia, from Amazonas to La Guajira, just to. Yeah, exactly. So now, uh, since we are talking about Colombia, and this is the, our roundtable about Colombia, I got an exercise for you, and I have I actually have the the answers, the ideas that you give me, uh, the possible questions related to Colombia. So if I have Bogota, uh, what is the possible question for Bogota? Mm, what's the weather like? Bogota? Mm, no. <laughs> I mean, in this case, we need to prepare. Okay, no. Uh, okay, Bogota what, is the what answer. What famous for? For me. the capital city of Colombia? Would be. Could be, yeah. What is the capital of Colombia? I mean, all questions are possible as long as they are like correct in, in the structure. But uh, yeah, in this case, this is a possible question. What's the capital of Colombia? Then I have a picture of Bogota and I can have students describe the picture. I mean, we're not going to do that. It's just to let you know that it is a possible activity as a warm up. Next, 32, 32. Here we're practicing a question that is not that easy for students to create, to write. Yeah, in that case would be, for example, how old are you? Or how old is the city? Or how many localities does the city have? If we are keeping talking about Bogota, 
I would say yes. I mean, I would say no, 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 no. That, that's not the no, no. I mean, I would say yes, but I, I can give you uh, more clues. Okay, it has to do with Colombia, and I'm gonna give you examples: Atlántico, Antioquia, Valle del Cauca. Yeah, Caquita. in that case, is is how many how many states does Colombia have? Exactly. So some people say departments. I also can use states. So in this case, I can say, uh, Ulysses, can you please tell me five Colombian departments, states, five? Actually, yes. I would start with mine, Chocó, and then I go to Angelica, Valle del Cauca, Antioquia, Caquetá, Lovely, and Putumayo. Exactly. And here we can practice even prepositions of place, location. Okay. I can say, where is Chocó located, Ulysses? Where is Chocó located? It is located in the Pacific coast of Colombia, close to Medellin and also yeah. to the Valle del Cauca. Exactly. By the way, the flight uh, Chocó uh, Kibdo Medellin is just 25 minutes. Right Ulises, next. Is, Ulises is a very knowledgeable student. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what, he, knows, um, he knows all the answers. Yeah, we didn't prepare that. It's just <laughs> wax palm. What is wax palm? Mm, oh, that, was that related to Colombia? What What is the tree of Colombia, the representative tree of Colombia? Angelica, right. Yeah, this is what's the national tree of Colombia that is in the beautiful Valle del Cocora. And here we can see a picture from uh, Salento. It's just three minutes away from Salento. And we have the location. I and mean, we can use the map to ask the students uh, maybe where it's, where it's located compared to Medellin, to Bogota, and so on. But uh, this is a place worth visiting, Valle del Cocora, where we can find, we can see a lot of wax palms, our national tree. One more, yellow, blue, and red. The tree, what are the colors of the, the flag, the national flag? Exactly. And here we can use some realia. I remember that I told you before that I love flags. So you have one. And if you have another one, you can have students compare the flags. I mean, compare the Spanish, the flag from Spain, the flag from uh, USA, the Canada flag. I mean, this is, I love flags, but I use them in my classes. So this is another activity that you can have in your classes. And finally, August 15th, 2022. I know that this is more challenging but that's, that's the idea, that students think in our classes, it's not just giving them only questions that is as Bogota, but when you say August, August 15th, what is, what is the possible question for that? You know, it's a high advanced question. Jaime, what do you think, Jaime? It's a high advanced question, so Ulises- So you were selected as a answer. high level <laughs> student. <laughs> Ulises Any idea? Know. The students are going to get impatient. Wait, wait, we wait, don't know, yeah. we have no idea. Right. When is the anniversary of the independence of the city? Actually, uh, no, it's not, but uh, no. Okay. In, no idea, my dear friend. No idea. Okay, it's a festivity in Colombia. Something happened. It's a festival in Medellin. I, I can give you a clue. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. You see, it's it's the flower knows. fair. Exactly. Exactly <laughs> on that day, there was a desfile silletero. So this is another way to have to present the topic in, in our classes. So in this case, we're going to talk about, it's an example today, we're going to talk about Colombia festivity. So we have the Sfiles Silleteros that was held like a month, two months ago in Medellin. Uh, so this is the famous Sfiles Silleteros. This was the warm up I wanted, I wanted to share with you just to give you or reinforce some ideas that I have for your classes. And this is a, a good example. And you can spend the whole hour with these five slides, it's up to you, but we can spend from 10 minutes to an hour or even two hours with the same activity. So thank you. Thank you for participating in that. Thank you. Jaime. Thank you, dear Mauricio. Hi, thank I don't you. know, but thank I have the for... questions here, but uh, you can know because we have some. Perfect, I mean, perfect, that's, Mauricio. Is that okay? Sorry about perfect, that. Perfect, yeah. perfect, wonderful. Okay, my dear friends, Mauricio, Angelica, Jose, and Ulysses, we are going to start with the first question. How would you describe the reality of the teaching learning process in Colombia at schools, institutes, and universities? So we are going to start with our good friend, Jose Lobo. Jose? I, I guess he has yeah, some Yes, okay. yes I'm here. I'm not going right. to turn on the camera because I'm only using my cell phone data. Don't, don't worry, don't worry. And, I don't want to break up, you know, so. Could, could you stop sharing your screen, Mauricio, so I can accept other people? Or you need it? 
Thank you. Okay. Jose Lobo, go on. So the process of teaching in Colombia, that's the question, right? So it's, yes. uh, um, how would you describe how would you describe the reality of the teaching learning process in your in Colombia at schools, institutes, and universities? So we have um, we have various universities in Colombia, um, Universidad Javeriana that, that, that we have like uh, teaching programs for uh, so that so that people can become teachers of English. Uh, Universidad del Atlántico, Universidad Distrital, Universidad Nacional, uh, Universidad de Antioquia, um, Universidad de, de la Amazonía, Universidad del Cauca. There's, and you know, in every region we have uh, we have various universities. I would say that the that the process, well, that well, I think that this is basic, and, and in schools, kids learn English, you know. Uh, from 2005, from kindergarten to to high school, um, I would say that a big challenge is the fact that this is an in progress process. It, it is an in progress process. Not that the government has not um, uh, invested in the process; the government has invested a lot. Um, um, and companies like uh, the British Council. Uh, um, the, the, the various uh, centros culturales colombo-americanos and various uh, various universities in the world they have helped Colombia in so many ways. Colombia has really, really invested a lot of money in, in in this. Now, there's only one problem, and it's a big problem that it's a Bogotano perspective. It means that um, they have sent the British Council from Bogota to all the regions. They have sent. Um, well, they have the Centro Colombo Americanos that are decentralized, you know, in the regions. That's very good, you know, because they know the cultures, the different cultures of the country. But I think that we need more involvement of universities in Colombia. But we have uh, Universidad del Norte that has has participated a lot in, in in my city. But those are basically private universities. I think that Universidad Nacional has also done something. Um, other universities in the country as well. But we need to get everybody involved, and it's only very few, um, very few groups, very few groups. Statistically speaking, and um, from a research perspective, the process is really the, the, the prospects are not very good. Only uh, according to to a research conducted by a professor at Universidad de Antioquia, only uh, ten percent. Of the Colombian of the of the school children population tested um, in terms of bilingualism is bilingual. Out of the many 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 out of the millions of Colombian kids, you know, only ten percent are bilingual from public and private schools. But most of them, um, and then checking the information and checking the numbers, only uh, um, and the majority of those kids or that ten percent is made up of kids who come from private schools. So public schools are really not um, doing that much in terms of, I mean, they are, they, are, they are helping in Barranquilla, for example, through the British Council. That's very good. That's a new program. But we need to do a lot more like in places like Chocó, La Guajira, um, in Amazonia, uh, in, in remote areas. But everything, uh, the way I see it, is is centralized. That's where the success is taking place, but not in the outskirts. The outskirts in general in Colombia, mm, just like the, the political system in Colombia uh, has forgotten the uh, the remote regions, the regions where this, there's the, the natives and the Afro-Colombian people and the, and the low income populations of the country. The government has invested, but it needs to do a lot more and it needs to be a lot more efficient. Now, I'm not, I'm not inventing this. I'm just saying this according to statistics. Statistics is not really helping. Um, it's not really telling, tell, I mean, the government has done a lot, but it needs to be a little more, um, um, in, um, they, they need to involve more teachers, a lot more teachers from diverse groups and from various, various regions, not only from certain regions in the country, but from various, various regions, so that the work is more like a, like group work, teamwork. That's my answer.
Thank you so much, dear Jose. Now, Mauricio, back to you. How would you describe the reality of the teaching learning process in Colombia in general? Mauricio. All right, Jaime, thanks. Uh, let me start by saying that now in Colombia, uh, we are expected to follow a suggested English curriculum that uh, it was launched in 2016. So uh, this suggested curriculum uh, is supposed to be implemented in not only high schools, but also elementary schools. So we have this book. For example, Jaime, if, you are, uh, if you're teaching in Medellin, uh, if you say, Omar, I was assigned seventh grade, I can say, oh, Jaime, please look, take a look on this curriculum. And there are some, uh, let's say, standards, competences that are, you are supposed to, to teach that year. So we also have the basic learning rights for each grade. Uh, and students, are supposed to have a book. Public schools, they have a book from sixth to eighth grade, it's called Way to Go. So this is a book, contextualized book. It has many things about Colombia, about touristic places like Cartagena, Valle del Cauca, things like that. And ninth, 10th, 11th grade, they're using English, please. So, uh, but let me tell you something. Uh, before uh, the Ministry of Education created those resources, teachers were asking about that. They say, oh, we need some books. We need more training. We need a suggested, oh, we need a curriculum for the whole country. Once we had it, uh, we have some uh, teacher training, training for, for teachers, let's say almost all over Colombia. I was one of those trainers and what happened? Before that, as I told you before, teachers were asking about that. But once we have the trainings, only 20% of them attended those trainings, in my case, in my case, in my city. And they, they say that now the principal, the school principal didn't allow them to go there, uh, that they had another appointment. So it's when I say, you were asking for that. Now that we have all of the resources, and then we, I, I wanna say me, we kept complaining and say, no, this book is not aligned uh, with our sixth graders level. So what I'm saying is that uh, I agree with what Jose says, but uh, sometimes it's also we lack commitment because I saw that, especially in Medellin and other cities in the coffee region, when I was there, only 20% of teachers attended those uh, uh, training. Now, uh, the reality is that uh, when you go to the schools, yeah, that's true. And this book is for ninth grade. But when you see the topics, you say, oh, my students, I mean, they don't have the linguistic competences to deal with that topic. So that is, that's, that's, what, that, that's something that is happening also nowadays that I'm teaching virtually in one of the programs that Jose uh, mentioned in, in Atlantico, in Barranquilla. Uh, during the pandemics, I, I've been teaching in some several bilingualism projects, not only in Medellin, but also in Barranquilla, Bogotá, Manizales. And what's happening? They say, oh, Mauricio, you need to teach, I mean, the, the content of this book, unit number one, two, or also other books that the British Council is using now. But when you go there, your students don't even know the basic, like the verb to be. They don't know the numbers. They don't know basic things. And that is why you say, okay, I'm supposed to complete this, and my students are expected to get level B1, and they are level A1 in the Common European Framework of Reference. And I'm, I know that uh, in four months, they won't reach that level. So this is what sometimes I, I, I'm honest. I say, okay, I want, I, I'm supposed to use the book, but I prefer to teach other things that are, would be even more meaningful for students. I'm being honest about that. But it was a, 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 a perspective. I mean, it was like, a, I, I just want to let you know that we have this now in Colombia. Uh, just one quick question, Mauricio. These books are, are free for the students? They are given for free? Exactly. Wow. I would say all, I mean, all, many, many like public schools, they have the books. Uh, of course, I mean, the students can't write down on these books because they are going to be supposed to be used by other students. But uh, I have seen those books in, 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 in several, several uh, public schools. Other schools, they have other schools, they have the books. 
I don't uh, two years ago before the pandemic, like after three years and uh, the books were launched, they were inside some boxes. So they, the principals, I would say the principal didn't even open those boxes. So just to reflect on that. Okay. And yeah, I had experience like a month ago, I went to a, a high school in the coast and I said, okay, uh, teacher, I, I want to do this, this. And he said, no, I'm, I'm in Mauro, Mauricio. My students are expected to this week to study the difference between going to and will. And I say, okay, because this is what the curriculum says either. And I say, all right, when I was there in the school, as I told you, I mean, for they didn't even know how, I mean, when I say, how old are you or even what's your name? They struggle to answer those questions. And I say, okay, if they don't know those topics, how, I mean, how I'm going to teach the difference between will and going to. Okay. It's a big dilemma. Th thank you so much, dear Mauricio. Could you please stop sharing your screen? And now back to you, Angelica, with the first question. How would you describe uh, the reality of the teaching learning process in Colombia? Yeah, actually, I agree with, with both uh, presenters. They, I mean, the two of them have uh, a point. And I would also say that there is a lot to do, yes. There is, there has been a lot done, yes. But the, the, the real situation is that the students level in Colombia, the, stu the, the, the level of English in our students in Colombia is absolutely low absolutely poor. I have had the experience to teach in different institutions. And at this moment, I'm working on an, a private institution in Cali. And uh, the, I mean, the panorama that I see there is so frustrating. When I see my students afraid of English, I mean, they are not afraid, they are terrified. Most of them terrified, bored about learning English. They don't want to learn. They don't want to see the class. And at the end of the, of the term, they tell me, hey, we have learned a lot during one or two months, more than we learned in high school. So I go like, okay, what is happening there? I mean, they, they, what, when I asked them what their classes were like in high school, they said, no, the teacher just arrived in the classroom and just gave us photocopied material, uh, translation, and that's it. I mean, when I, when I was a teacher in uh, different uh, programs in Colombia, teaching ELT programs in Colombia, I remember we used to work on uh, different uh, strategies, different methodologies. Um, uh, we, we also uh, had the opportunity to explore through research, different elements, intercultural elements. I mean, we could, we could have, I mean, many, many topics in different classes and in different semesters. But when these teachers, these graduate teachers go to face the reality, I don't know what happens, but they go like to do something different or they just go and do whatever they want in the classroom and that's it. I mean, I'm very, uh, I mean, I don't want to be negative, but I want to criticize this very strongly because it's been, I have had experience of teaching for 20 years in Colombia. And it's been the same, the same uh, uh, thing all the time, the same situation. So I don't understand what is happening if the government is making so much effort, if the government has uh, released different booklets, different materials, why aren't they using them in their classes? Why are our students going to university level and they don't have the level to 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 hold a, a short conversation in English an A1 or A2 level conversation in English. So the panorama, the reality, the the I mean it's really frustrating. It's really frustrating, especially for university teachers, because when they receive these students from high school, they don't know what to do. What I what I do is I I just uh, let's say I recycle everything in one or two classes. I try to recycle as much as possible, like uh, try to connect everything they were supposed to know. I don't take anything for granted and I just go straight to the, to the classes like that. So it is very, very frustrating in general terms, the way we are facing our realities in Colombia. And another thing that I have seen is that unfortunately we have adopted many of the 
curricula or a lot of the curricula from other uh, countries or from other realities into our reality. Our reality in Colombia is absolutely different from the reality in Europe. Our children in Colombia are not the same as our children or, or the children in Europe. So, however, in many, in many classes, you see how teachers are still teaching uh, the four seasons, for example. I mean, just straight like that, they don't make comparisons between the four seasons in Europe or in uh, Asian countries and, and the weather in Colombia. What uh, Mauricio did at the beginning, I, I really loved it because he was trying to make us refer to our um, culture and to our you know, local culture and try to express ourselves in English. And that is what I do with my students as well. Two or three weeks ago, I, I had the opportunity to work with my students on how to describe the Pacific region in English. And they learned a lot of vocabulary and put everything into practice. And it was level one students. So there are many things we can do, but I, I don't know if it is lack of love of, or lack of compromise or what is really happening. Yes, uh, today, for example, some uh, many teachers are taking the, their exams uh, to uh, participate in this uh, call for the government, uh, for, for being teachers subscribed uh, uh, to the government. And I heard that some teachers are buying the, the results. I mean, so if you are able to buy the results of an exam, how are you going to face your students? How are you going to ask your students to be honest with you? So I'm sorry to be very negative today, but I want to raise awareness on this because it's been a long time that I've seen this and I would like to do something about it, but it's really, really, difficult for us teachers because it's like some teachers want to do a lot but most teachers don't want to do much and they just want to go to school or to the real context and uh, just get their monthly payment and that's it. it's like something that you see and you feel frustrated because i've my my partners and my colleagues most of them not all of them are very you know compromised and very committed to their job so why is it happening like that. That is like, in general terms, my vision about the reality in Colombia. Thank you so much, dear uh, Angelica. And don't be sorry, you're just expressing what you see. And if you ask me, I will tell you the same thing in my country. So I think it's the same problem all over uh, Latin America. So now back to you, um, Ulises, please, the first question. Well, I would try to summarize what I my friends and prisoner were saying, and it is one thing I have highlighted here. I don't know if you're watching my, my presentation. Mm, Are no, you? we can't we can watch your presentation yet. Uh, not yet. Uh, not yet, not yet. Now, now it's coming, I guess. Yeah, uh, it's coming, okay. Yeah, in Facebook Live, it, it's visible. Well, it yeah. was. <laughs> so, I would say there are good things about Colombian uh, education and it may be happening in other Latin American countries and it is the legal framework for teaching English, okay? We got a, I would say a strong legal framework which includes um, the love of bilingualism, the general love of education that is telling what languages should be taught, mainly um, English as it is supposed to be to be in other countries. We have, for example, a love of bilingualism, which is suggesting what the expected level of a student is at the end of the school, uh, let's say, um, academic cycle. Then we have a standards, which are suggesting teachers what is that the government is trying to requests from the students. And then we have all what um, all, all of us have been mentioning, which is the basic learning rights. And then, um, but something I wanna to highlight today is that when we have in Colombia, like most of the countries uh, at the end of the school, uh, let's say cycle, there is a, a SAVER 11 test, which is suggesting a student should be in B1. However, there are, certain areas that we need to analyze why students are not getting to that level. And when we analyze, uh, maybe the question is gonna be 
uh, dropped by you later. It is <clears throat> our context, as, as Angelica was mentioning, is quite different. The, Colombia is a very diverse country in terms of not only culture, but also locations. Uh, maybe if you live in Cali, you wouldn't have any problem, but if you live in San States of Colombia, you have all the, the problems you can imagine. You know, let's say, for example, in some Colombian regions, they do not have um, electricity power. They use electricity power instead of using uh, the, the normal one. And then another problem is uh, the teacher's professional development. Although the government is trying to do something for, you know, to enhance the level of, of proficiency from the teachers, we still have problems where, where some teachers do, they do not have the SPECTI level, which is C1 for the Colombian cont context, which is a little bit high as soon as they graduate from the university, they have to have that level. But this is the tricky part, you know, for example, I'm a teacher and I have my permanent position there in Colombia at a school and I decided to have that international exchange program. But the regulation, the legal framework is suggesting that uh, the maximum time I can spend here is two years when my program is five years. And then I don't have the possibility to go back and contribute to the development of teaching English in Colombia. Uh, it's kind of weird because uh, it, it would be more flexible if teachers have this possibility. And I did it by my own. I did not have this possibility by the government. There, there are local bilingual plans. I would say those local um, bilingual plans are more, uh, let's say, administrative uh, budget spending than what actually a school needs. For example, the school I was working and I was working in the second largest city of the country, it, they do not have access to all the materials that are necessary in the, in the classes, the amount of hours you know, it's, it's four hour time for English classes. And all of us know that four hours in, in a large classroom, it is not, well, the expected time for the students to learn the language. Another good thing that we have, like say, I'm not talking about the, the beautiful things, you know, we have is the syllabus from a school. Every a school has, let's say, a curriculum in which English is, is, is the language students are supposed to learn and all teachers get together to work on that syllabus and they are expected to analyze the scenario and the context where they work in order to say what exactly from the you know, federal government they will take. And finally, we have teachers uh, that are professional teachers in mainly almost all the Colombian big cities are the ones that are teaching students. But what is happening? All those professional teachers who are teaching students are after the great third. It means before that time, at least in public schools, the students do, do not have the possibility to have a professional teacher. They have a let's say a core teacher who is teaching all the subjects, but he's not uh, specifically a professional in EFL. And then I would say the legal framework is beautiful because we got all like try to, org to be organized. They are giving, you know, like the handouts and possibilities on what to do. And for example, the bilingual plans, um, the, the year before I participated on some strategies, they are offering programs to the teachers. But like uh, my dear uh, colleagues Lobo was saying, those, uh, let's say, regulations are not taking into account the different contexts we have in Colombia. And I would say this is the major problem we have because the voices of those local communities are not being heard. And that's what I would say now is one of the biggest problems. Uh, this is the reality. Teachers are, <clears throat> are always uh, reflecting about why they do not have more opportunities to teach, why they do not have more resources 
why they do not have more, uh, let's say, international opportunities to upgrade the level of English. And I would say this is our reality. The students are, are in the classroom. Uh, they do not have more options than English. Then they are forced to learn English at least at a um, you know, secondary cycle. When they go to the university, it's another business. They can suggest uh, select from one or two countries. I would say this is um, my answer so far for this question. This is the reality. Uh, I agree with all what my, my, my colleagues have been saying about the reality of teaching and learning English in Colombia. However, I would put that in, in the challenges, you know, because um, I think later on we will have that question. Okay, thank you so much, Ulises. Uh, let, me, let me share uh, my screen. Uh, wait, let, there is a, a comment. There is a comment I want to show you uh, made in Facebook Live by Alba Garcia from Ecuador. She says it happens in Ecuador as well in public schools. Learners are afraid of learning. Well, uh, that is a reality and we should do something about it. We'll talk about that later. Question number two, Angelica, Mauricio, Jose, and Ulises. What are the principal challenges of the teachers to become professionals in Colombia? Okay, so let's start now this time with Mauricio. All right, Jaime. Uh, I want to uh, uh, talk about this question, uh, okay. beginning with the common framework. All right, common European framework of reference. Now in Colombia, uh, if you study an undergraduate program, uh, not about licenciatura in idiomas, but let's say engineering, uh, physics, chemistry, most students need to have a B2 level to get the diploma. Now, if you are going to be an English teacher, you need a C level in the Common European Framework. So what you have to do is to take an exam, a standardized exam, like TOEFL, IBT, IELTS, or some exams that universities uh, design for students. I know some cases that students, some students uh, have finished their classes and they haven't been able to get the diploma to teach or licenciatura in idiomas because they don't have the level. So they can spend six months, even a year without the diploma because they don't have the level. So in the, sometimes uh, what, what universities are doing, they say, let's say an example with an engineer student. They say, okay, if you don't have the B2 level to graduate, you have two options. Take the TOEFL IBT this week or next week. It's gonna be like $200. Take the exam, but if a student has an A1 level, how come in a week he's going to get a B2 in TOEFL IBT? So the second option is our university can offer something to you. What is it? So you can take six levels, 10 levels in here at the university, each one is going to cost like $80, maybe $100. And they don't say that you're going to get the B2, but it's kind of, if you pay those 10 levels, kind of, you're gonna get the B2 level. So when students graduate, they are supposed to have the B2 level, but that B2 level is not really intermediate, could be a steel basic. So this is why I, I want to focus this question on what we are facing with the famous common European framework of reference. So now students who are going to be teachers, they complain and they say, it's not my fault that uh, I didn't get the skills at the university, uh, English skills to, I mean, to have the C1 level. And now the university is asking me to have, to take this C1 level. So students can take the C1 level exam today. They can pay for that. And they try to take it in one month, next month, but uh, their level is not going to, go from B2 to C1 in a week or in a month. So this is the big challenge that we are facing. Even now, we as teachers, every time that I, let's say 90% of the times that I'm gonna be hired, they ask me about my C1 exam. So this is something is a must. I used to teach in Panama. In Panama, they don't literally, they don't care about this common European framework. They don't need those kind of examinations. But in Colombia, we need to have this exam 
every two years. So for example, my TOEFL IBT is going to expire in January. Now I'm thinking about getting the money to, have the, to take the exam in January so I can keep uh, applying for different teaching jobs in Colombia, just to let you know that. So that is why I wanna talk about those uh, issues in Colombia. Oh, very, very interesting. They are, um, they are uh, Evoli, uh, ah, Mauricio, could you, uh, sorry, <laughs> there was a mistake. Very interesting mm -hmm. that you have to take the, uh, the you have to uh, um, take the exam every two years, right? You said? Exactly, because most of those exams are valid only for two years. And they are expensive, $200. Yeah, yes, so, they are. Yes, they are. Thank you so much. Now, uh, you, Angelica, please, the second question. What are the principal challenges of the teachers to become professionals in Colombia besides the information Mauricio has given to us? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> if you make a, uh, or if you do a short, um, very brief analysis throughout the documents that have been written and produced by different teachers and researchers in Colombia, you see a constant uh, word or a constant element or a permanent one, which is colonization. We have been colonized in many ways, unfortunately. And in some cases we have lost our reality and we have lost our pr uh, proper uh, realities because we want to move forward and we want to forget what we really are. So in that sense, I think we should go back to our roots and be proud of being who we are. And in that way, we can take this language as one more language, as a vehicle to communicate culture, as many as many researchers have said it before. I mean, a language is just a language, but the problem is that in our country, in our beautiful, fantastic country, the policies are on top of even the, the quality of education. Because in many cases we see how politicians, they, I mean, they they think they know, they pretend they know a lot, but they do not do not know much about the realities of our educational system in Colombia. So they want to show results to uh, people abroad, to the international community. They want to show results and yes, of course, they have different booklets and they have different uh, things on paper, but the reality is different. As, as um, Ulysses was mentioning before, the reality in Chocó is absolutely different. The reality in Amazonas is absolutely different. And of course, the educational system in Colombia is centralized. Yes, we see how successful uh, some schools are in Bogotá. Uh, in, the, in terms of bilingualism program. Yes, some schools are successful. Some students have very good level. Even in Barranquilla, I know that the level of English in, or in schools in Barranquilla is amazing because of the efforts of the local government, not of the central government. So there is like a, like a, like a crash between the government policies and the educational policies. So some teachers have made big efforts to, to try to fix the problem, but there is a lot to be done. So that is the challenge, how to find uh, like, a, like a, let's say like a moment or like a, a, a point in between policies and educational system and the realities of our students in Colombia. That would be like the main challenge in my view. Thank you so much, dear um, Angelica. Now back to you, Jose Lobo. Hi, Jaime, and, hello, and hello. everyone. Yes, I'm here. Um, the question is, what are the main challenges of teachers to become professionals in Colombia? And um, um, the, the, um, what Mauricio and, and Professor Angelica mentioned was, was true. Yeah, um, we have issues. We have language issues in Colombia. Um, I would say that um, that in terms of foreign languages, because it's not only about English, and that's what Professor Angelica was mentioning, that English is only another language, is not the language. You know, even though it is the language of finances and the language of commerce, 
um, it is just another language. I remember that when I went to the UK, I had to take, um, to teach in the United Kingdom, I had to take a lot of, uh, I did, I, I took a lot of examinations, but the people from Spain didn't have to take those exams, only um, people from the third world, because our high school system, our university system is thought to be uh, uh, a low standard type of educational system. But anyway, I would say um, that proficiency exams are good for business, but that business is not Colombian, that business is not uh, Argentine, that business is not Mexican, that business is not, we don't have an exam in Spanish to test uh, British people when they come here down here to Colombia to teach English. I had to take an exam to go to the UK, you know, <laughs> to teach Spanish. And um, I mean, they tested everything, um, you know, they, they tested, they even checked my, my, my criminal background, everything. You know, when I went to the United States as well, I had to take the TOEFL exam. Uh, um, but when they come down here, they don't even speak the language, you know, of the local communities. So I think it's a matter, I think that language proficiency, as uh, uh, Norman Fairclough suggests, is used to sift, separate, and discriminate as well. You know, um, now I, I'm, I believe that we have to test our English. Yes, we do. But I think that everybody has to test his or her English, her Spanish, her French, her German, her Arabic, her Chinese. I mean, every, uh, otherwise it is discriminatory. Why do we have to test our English and they don't test their Spanish or their French or their German or their Arabic or their whatever? You know what I'm saying? Why are we the only ones being tested? That means that we are inferior. Right. I mean, I, I'm sorry about that. I, and it has to do with the issue of colonization. Now, I agree with the fact that Mauricio said that we uh, proficiency exams are expensive. <laughs> yeah, they are a lot expensive. Um, um, I think that um, in the United Kingdom, Dobson, in the year 2020, a person who worked for the Council of Europe, he said that in the United Kingdom, they do not foster the teaching of foreign languages intensively. In Colombia, we don't foster the teaching of English intensively. We just do it in bilingual schools for rich people, people who are very wealthy, but not for low income people. In the UK, they do not foster the teaching of foreign languages you know, for uh, public schools or in public schooling um, because they are scared, they are afraid of losing their British identity. The same thing happens in the United States because they are afraid of, you know, kind of getting lost in the, ident in the, in the issue of identities because they are multicultural countries, but our countries too, our countries too, but we have been, as what um, Angelica says, we have been colonized. I suggest for Colombia and for all Latin America, uh, I suggest two things or three things. First one, the use of project-based teaching, you know, teaching based on projects. Number two, using content-based teaching. It means combining, for example, English and mathematics, English and geography, English and history, so that kids could have um, a lot more to learn. Now, one of the problems that we have in Colombia, and that's what Mr. Um, Mr. Uh, um, Ulises mentioned, he said that the, the number of hours at schools is not, not significant. That is true, that is true. In primary schools, in, uh, in El Atlantico, in little schools, in little public schools, in, in, here in, in, in my area, you know, um, they only teach two hours a week. That's not significant, number one. Number two, the teachers of English are not licenciados. They are not English language teachers. They are teachers, they are biology teachers, they are math teachers, they are early childhood education teachers. They don't know English. How are they teaching English? That's why they don't go to some of the uh, trainings that uh, Mauricio organizes, you know, because they don't understand English. So, and I know that because I check the, I check the, um, 
the, the thesis from several masters and doctoral students at the Atlantico University, and they go to schools. I also go to some schools, um, you know, in remote areas, like um, there's, there's a, a Native American, um, there's a Native American uh, population here in my, in my, very close to my city. And when I know there's only one teacher for first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth grade, you know, she doesn't know English, but she teaches mathematics to everybody at the same time. At what time does she have? She doesn't have the time to learn English, number one, because she has to travel two hours to go to school, two hours to come back to school, to come back to her house. Huh? And um, um, she doesn't have, they don't have internet. Sometimes they don't have electricity. Sometimes they don't have water. So, so, so the reality of Colombia is far more complex and far more difficult to understand, you know, if you are not in the field. So we have to get to the field. We have to work with the te teachers one by one. And that's what the Colombian government needs to do to, you know, the Colombian government needs to dirty its hands, you know, from the real reality of Colombia, not from the reality that they have from, you know, from the center, but they have to get to all the areas and be more inclusive. Thank you. Thank you, Jose, for your deep thoughts and ideas and opinions. Uh, there are many things that we share in all the other countries in Latin America and that other people have mentioned before. Thank you so much. And to finish the second uh, question, uh, dear Ulises. So I will certainly say I am in agreement with all that my colleagues and friends have been saying relating to what the challenges are. But I want to go more specific on areas that I suffered when I was a student and I was trying to become a teacher. And the number one, believe it or not, some universities of Columbia still need work on resources, you know, offer students more materials or more facilities so that they learn English in, in the best, in a better way. For example, open up um, English lab laboratories in which students have opportunities to work not only with all what the teachers are doing in their universities, but also they can open their mind and have access to different information on the website. Um, I don't know if that is happening in other, you know, let's say countries of Latin America, I'm not sure, but I wanna highlight that because this is important for, for, for the student. And another thing is uh, some university policies, they need to open up a little bit more uh, let's say interchanges opportunities uh, or changing academic opportunities with other universities, not only in, in, in you know, where English is spoken, but also uh, in all Latin America to get together and know what exactly our heritage is. Uh, for example, I was surprised that in here there is a, a, a Hispanic um, um, week and months that are highlighting what we do uh, for you know this land, which is uh, America, and they, it, it, it is very interesting. Another thing I would say it is important to analyze is the new organization the government is providing to all the licenciatura, which is the EFL degree programs, because they are suggesting that we have to master same certain level, but they are including certain areas that, that have to be taught in the programs. And then that's, uh, let's say, lessening opportunities for students to have more core courses in English. Uh, I will also highlight things that are happening, I would say, according to what I have been reading in all Latin America, and it is the literacy rates, you know, students need to read more and read in terms of becoming very excellent reader to understand what they are reading. So uh, most of teachers are graduating from EFL degree programs and they do not understand a book in English, although they got the level, but they are not good readers. That needs to be incorporated. And another thing uh, I would say uh, that happens in, in my country um, and is the funding for the students, you know. So some students are struggling to get to the university and, and they, they have to work a lot. They, they do not have time to study. And that, that's, that's 
in certain areas is affecting the level that the government is expecting. Um, I would say uh, other important areas I would mention here is sometimes uh, is the lack of time uh, of planning for teachers because I have experienced that with uh, being working for a university and I was working, let's say, 20 hours and I didn't have time to plan. And I was asking them, when I have time to plan to see what my students uh, are revising and reflect about this. And then this is also like telling students um, uh, at university presidents that, well, we have to take this job seriously because our, the, the, our students' performance is not what is expected. Uh, um, if I am not wrong, uh, Angelica was mentioning that, and Mauricio was mentioning that, and these are real uh, uh, things that are happening in Colombia. And at the same time, uh, the performance pressure from the government. So if you don't do this, you do not graduate. I would say uh, we need to keep a balance on what uh, international demand is and what our local community can do then we, we adapt what they are expecting. But here is the fact, um, um, dear Jaime, it is uh, to me what Dr. Lobo was saying is marketizing English learning in Latin America. All the, the companies that you can see that are testing, all the companies that are you know, publishing the books, they, they are not from Latin America. And that's something that Dr. Uh, Jaime Usma is saying, and to some extent that marketizing English is discriminating people who are not able to get access to the courses to finish the university with the SPECT level, to finish a school with the SPECT level, and what is what we have been experiencing. We have been experiencing a new era of displacing people from their rights because they are not able to pay for extra courses. What about if I want to graduate from the university, I don't have a spectrum level, but I finish all my studies uh, playing and I don't have $250 uh, to graduate. And then what is going to happen with me? I can't graduate. And that's part of the market. That's marketizing English level and is displacing people. And to some extent, it's a, it's a new dynamic. And I would say the new government from Colombia needs to analyze that and try to change that perception that English is. Well, English is a language. English is not a life, you know? Although we, we know as an English teacher, we have to have certain expected level of proficiency, but we are going to be teachers. What about if I am a good, um, let's say, I have all the pedagogical, um, you know, my philosophies in mind and I have a problem with English. So we need to keep a balance on that. And finally, I would say, uh, there are a lot of limitations uh, when the students want to, to become teachers. The, the number one is most of the programs, although there are public universities, uh, are very expensive and not everybody got access to materials. English books at the university are almost all private. So uh, most of the students do not have the funding to buy books. Um, and finally, I would say there is a like lack of self uh, management opportunities. Our students are now self-minded. They are like still need to to have that role from the teacher telling them what to do. And one of my recommendations for for all the students that are now uh, starting to become a teacher is to um, be more responsible uh, about what they are doing uh, to be an efficient teacher because there are lots of opportunities, but they need to work hard on what they uh, that is called the standard because uh, as Lobo, I am now here in, in the US and to being able to make it, I have to take a lot of exam and, and I have to pay a lot of money. And then this is like telling you that there are possibilities, it's possible. One of my recommendations is um, try to be more exposed to the language. Um, I know there are regions in Colombia that that's, that's not that's not possible because um, it's 
you, you speak Spanish in the classroom and then you go home and you, uh, sorry, you speak English in the classroom and then you go home and speak Spanish and all your friends speak uh, Spanish and then you don't see the need of speaking English. But uh, remember, you will be an English uh, an English teacher and then that's, that's like your responsibility. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, dear Ulises. Uh, Mauricio, could you stop sharing your screen just a moment, please? Thank you so much. Okay, before we go on with the next question, uh, we have some people here in, in, in the Zoom audience, like Marilu, Arturo Phil from Peru, Alejandra Tobón, uh, Jose Alejandro Chalaput, Luz Angélica Robayo, Valentina Rivera, Jorge Eliezer, Jaramillo, our good friend Juan Carlos Bar Vargas uh, Milan from Millán, from Colombia, Cesar Murillo, Monica Vinuesa, our good friend from Ecuador, Luis Bermúdez from Ecuador, Maria Teresa Terán from Bolivia, Filmor Murillo and Mara. If one of you wants to say something, and, and Marco Antonio Paricio, sorry, from Mexico, and our president, Raj Gil from Canada. So if you have, uh, if you want to make a, a comment, very short comment, please, on the first two questions, anybody? Anybody wants to say something? Uh, yes, good morning. Okay, Cesar Murillo, where are you from? I'm from Colombia. Okay. Uh, Please, be briefly, because we need to continue, say your opinion. Yes, I would like to know what the, um, the lecturers uh, think about the fact that in high schools or in schools, our students must be like paying attention to several subjects uh, regarding the proficiency level they are expected to, to reach by the end of, of their high school. I would like to know their opinions about that. Thank you, Cesar. Any, any of the four guest speakers can answer that question? Just one of you, please. Can you please repeat the question, please? Cesar Murillo, could you please repeat the question? Yes, of course. Uh, for example, in Colombia, as students must pay attention to around 16 different subjects and okay. uh, governments are expected to are, expect, are expecting them to reach like a specific uh, English proficiency level however they have to respond for different activities in in, a, in those subjects so regarding the the proficiency level the government expects well what do you say about that? I mean, what can we what can we do to reduce the gap between the proficiency level they are getting in high schools and the proficiency level universities are expecting these students to to have? Okay, I, I understand the question. Anybody, Jose, Angelica, Mauricio, Ulises, just one of you? Please. Yeah, I, I want to say something. That's another problem we have in Colombia. Our students are being multitasking. They have a lot of subjects. And how they will have a real performance in one when they have 17, um, 17 subjects. Okay, and, say, what, and what is your recommendation then? So my recommendation is under those circumstances, they won't uh, reach the SPECTI level. We have to analyze deeply in different schools what is the mandatory subjects that from the government? If I am not wrong, they are nine. And fox their attention on those nights to reach expected levels. But with 17 subjects, I think it wouldn't happen. It won't, it won't happen because it won't work well. So my recommendation is to all the principals analyze the mandatory subjects from the, uh, from the Ministry of Education. And based on that, plan the curriculum of the high schools, especially the public high schools. Thank you, uh, Thank you so let much. Let me add something about what Elisa said. But briefly, about, please, about, to continue, yeah. Mauricio. No, this is part of the five question. I mean, I can I, I skip five, but this is the answer that I have for Cesar. Cesar, uh, let's begin with, by saying that uh, we need to plan meaningful lessons. Why we spend, or we have students repeat the daily routine for five minutes, how often do they do it in Spanish? Do I say me levanto almuerzo? I mean, you have to compare and see how often do we say our daily routine in Spanish as the way we ask students to tell it, say in class. Another thing, when we teach comparatives, 
is worthy to teach uh, rabbits are faster than turtles? How often do we say that in Spanish? So we need to create meaningful tasks. I mean, this is one. Second, we have to model. When you ask, please write a paragraph about your city. How often do we show the paragraph before? Because we have to spend 30 minutes giving instructions. So we have only one hour. So 30 minutes giving instructions and 30 minutes for students asking questions, what do we have to do? So what about if you have a poster with the model we wrote, we, 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 and, and the, the blackboard here, and the students are gonna see what they, uh, we, what we are expecting from them. And three, we need also to, as Jose uh, said before, we need to mix subjects, classes. I mean, students complain in my classes in Colombia, in Medellin. They, when I teach, what is the chemical symbol of gold in English? Teacher, this is no chemistry class. Uh, what is the capital of England? Teacher, this is no geography class. No, I mean, we are, you, uh, we are used to learning only adjectives, speak, spoke, spoken, spoken in English classes. Why don't we go beyond and also like try to combine content-based learning in our classes? So this is basically, my, and also teach meaningful vocabulary. Don't spend too much time trying to, that your students learn raccoon. How often do we say raccoon skunk in, 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 in Spanish? Jaime, when was the last time that you say mapache in Spanish? I guess just one time in my life. Exactly, <laughs> but uh, we just push students in one hour to learn 10 animals that uh, we don't even know. So basically, yeah. <laughs> this is what I, so, I want so, to say. So, so we, we need we need another workshop with you, Mauricio. You see? <laughs> yeah. yeah, we need to be more practical. I mean, oh, okay. yeah, let's compare, right? <laughs> okay, uh, we will have more time at the end to invite other people to speak. Now let's go to question number three or question number four, Mauricio. You were asking me, Mauricio. Question three or four? You said number three. Uh, okay. Let me. Okay, just just two of you or, or one of you, please. Where can you become a licenciado in lengua inglesa in Colombia? And what are the requirements to graduate? Some of you have already mentioned that. So if one of you or two of you want to talk about that, where can I become a, a licenciado in, in, in English in Colombia? And what are the requirements? Anyone? Yes, can I answer that, please? Please, please, Jose. So there's different universities. In Bogota, there's Universidad Javeriana, uh, Universidad Distrital, Universidad Nacional. There's various universities. There's a lot of universities in Bogota. And that's, that's really good for them. And at, um, in, Colum in Barranquilla, we have Universidad del Atlantico, and uh, we also have uh, Universidad Americana, but there's various private universities as well. And then uh, we also have Universidad uh, 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 in, in Cali, I forgot the name, um, Universidad del Valle, you know, uh, Universidad de Antioquia, in different regions, Universidad de la Amazonía, you know, Universidad del Cauca, there's various, various universities. Now the, the answer, I, I wanna answer that part, the answer about the requirements, um, first of all, you need to have a good level of English, you know, and you need to pass an exam, that's a, that's a hard one because sometimes students don't pass the test. Sometimes I would say, I wouldn't say all the time. Number two, you need to uh, have several requirements like a thesis requirement or a research article requirement or an internship requirement, international internship requirement. Also, you have to defend your thesis or your article or you have to defend the project. If uh, you do not, if you are not successful in your thesis um, uh, defense, then you cannot graduate. Um, also, you need to have a practicum. Um, in some areas, there's two practicums. It means practices, you know, teaching practices. There, there's two practicums or three practicums or four practicums. It depends on each university, you know. So that's my answer. Maybe somebody can, can add to it. Okay. Uh Angelica, are you going to add something? Yeah, apart from universities, there are some institutions or private institutions that offer um, specialized courses in ERT. There are also master's degrees that uh, people can uh, you know, do or study. Uh, there are different opportunities also abroad. There are universities which offer 
um, scholarships or internship uh, programs or exchange programs. Uh, there are many opportunities. There is a myriad of opportunities in Colombia to study uh, ELT uh, teaching. And uh, I would say that the level is very good. The programs are very good. But of course, we have we still have problems. We, we need to adjust some elements. But in, in what I have seen, the programs are well developed. But there is like a, like a gap, as this uh, partner uh, was asking question, the question before. There is like a gap between uh, the university levels and the, the system and the policies. So maybe there is something in there that needs to be uh, changed or improved. OK, just one uh, extra question talking about this topic. Uh, is there a system, um, a, a, um, a distance mode to study and become an English language teacher in Colombia? Yes, yes, Universidad eh, a distancia, a distancia, they have uh, um, a program for for ELT teachers, yes. Oh, great. I, I also work, uh, sorry for the interruption. I also work at a distance <coughs> education, which is Universidad Ventista, uh, located in Medellin. They are most famous for being UNAC, just uh, to make sure there is another one. Oh, interesting. Interesting, Ulises, thank you so much. Now let's go to the last question, number four. Uh, ah, okay, Mauricio. What are the English Teachers Association being in existence and how productive, how um, uh, influence are they in Colombia? So I guess you will start, right, Mauricio? Uh... Okay, actually, I just want to share with you that SOCOPI is the association in Colombia, but I'm not that involved with that association at all. But, yeah, but what is there the are perception? many. For me, I mean, could be useful, but for me, it hasn't been useful at all. Uh, during the pandemic, I kind of tried to offer a workshop, but uh, my, maybe my workshops aren't that academic for them. So <laughs> that is why I prefer to, I mean, even go to Peru, Tisol, and other places that. Uh, uh, presenting there. And actually I saw, I just saw the program for this current Asocopi convention that is gonna be in two weeks from now. And I say, uh-uh, I, I don't think my simple PowerPoint presentation will fit in this convention association. That's it. Okay, uh, I, I had an experience with that uh, association too. I sent my presentations to be accepted, but I was never accepted. So <laughs> I, I think they must have some kind of rubric, some kind of evaluation of your project. So, okay. Uh, anybody else who wants to talk about uh, uh, English associations? In yes. Colombia? I was thinking about the question you asked about challenges. And I think that would be one of the wonderful challenges for us as teachers and, and as members of probably members or, or of different associations in Colombia. If you go to an ELT conference in Colombia, you will find a lot of uh, topics related to new technologies, to uh, how to teach uh, according to the new advances and everything, but you never find um, a, a topic related to to how to teach English in Colombia in relation to cultural aspects, how to uh, involve stu students in Colombia to the new challenges after the pandemics in terms of culture, in terms of decolonization uh, processes, et cetera. So I think those ELT conferences, sometimes I go there because I need to update some knowledge in terms of, uh, uh, of methodologies, but usually I, I, I don't find them really interesting to me in most of their cases because they only aim at uh, things to show off or things to show results to, as I said before, to uh, other you know, external uh, companies or external um, people who are involved in this process of bilingualism in Colombia. So even the fact of, of calling bilingualism or bilingualism only to the process of English and Spanish, that is a big problem as uh, Jaime Usma Wilches says. So if you if you see all the literature that is that has been written 
uh, throughout these last years in Colombia, you will find the same situation. Many people, many teachers are complaining about this. So uh, uh, those uh, associations are not really working as they should. Okay. Uh, if, if I, I have had the great opportunity of listening to the roundtable of the Peruvian uh, teachers, uh, uh, also the Bolivian teachers, and also the Ecuadorian teachers. You are the, the group number four of teachers in Latin America. And I must say that the answers to all the questions must be all, are, are almost the same. Uh, teachers who need more uh, to be more... Um, to be more stable, more responsible, associations which don't work as we expect, and the governments, um, policies of the governments which are not appropriate for the uh, learning and teaching process and things like that. So now we have uh, like about 20 minutes to talk and discuss with the people here. Uh, so we have Marco Antonio from, um, from Mexico, Luis Bermudez from um, uh, Ecuador, Raj from Canada and other people from uh, Arturo. Arturo was here. Or he, he, yeah, Arturo from Phil from Peru and other people. So this is the time for you to give your opinions or points of view. But Sorry. briefly, please. But briefly, please, so we can talk. Yes, uh, uh, Ulysses. Uh, yeah, I would like to 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 do something um, because I I wanna give la la. I wanna highlight two or three facts. I'm gonna be very brief on them. And then, <clears throat> um, like I told you at the beginning, I think it, the challenges in general, based on all what we have been discussing here today, they have to do firstly with the resources. Most schools do not have access to respect to resources, although they have some books, but the books are not for everybody. Another thing I would say, based on our context is the problem in Colombia is the language exposure, especially for those urban areas which are far from the capital cities. The bilingual plans, as we have been talking today, are not based on what we expect. And, and, and Professor um, Angelica was mentioning that it is more related to marketizing English rather than really bilingual program. Another thing is related to these <clears throat> teachers associations funds, they are more related to how much money we, we can make up, uh, but not actually uh, analyzing and reflecting about the problems what, which are taking place at different schools in different uh, areas in Colombia. And another thing is the expectations. The expectations from the government is perfect, but the reality is not matching that, that expectations, you know? And all of us know in Colombia that what the Saber 11 chose is that we need more work on English. And the methodology, as Lowe was mentioning, we need to reach sign agreement on what exactly can best work for the Colombian context rather than adjust our teaching model to all international demand. Why? Because Colombia is a very multicultural country and at the same time, it is very varied in terms of locations here in, uh, there in the city. And just related to some areas, for example, that have to do with the administration part, with the number of students, the, love, the number of hours, and I would say uh, this is connected to the this last one I want to highlight. And I think it, this, based on all the problems, I, I would say there are opportunities for growth. For example, teachers that are starting participating of international programs, uh, teachers that are reflecting more than ever in Colombia, publishing uh, the, the reflections about pedagogical reflections and how that can help other teachers around the globe and in, and in the city and in the country. We have the advance of social media, which is uh, our students are having e-polls from all over the world and they are eager to learn the language because uh, they have more opportunities now than any any time before to travel abroad to study. And I would say that's, that's giving like a possibility that things can, 
can change promptly. That's what I wanted, I wanted just to highlight because, well, things are not going well, but there are opportunities uh, and, and the students are the ones that are making that opportunities to change our minds and, and change our this scenario. Thank you. Thank you, dear Dr. Ulysses, who is in the USA now. Congratulations, my dear. Before uh, giving uh, the chance of uh, speaking, let me show you uh, what the people in Facebook Live are saying. Dalia says, uh, with the learning, uh, with the learning experiences, students learn to solve problems in English. That is meaningful. That is a good start. Debra says this is such an important conversation. Thank you, Jaime, and all the speakers. Ilma, Ilma Guzman from, from Ecuador, listening to others, sharing similar situations is not only an eye-opener experience. It seems that most of our countries in Latin America share most of the goals to improve teaching and learning, but also the challenges to accomplish them. Gracia, Maria Mendoza, English associations, this is very important. English associations are a great source of support. And I think the approach uh, each association should take is cater to the needs of their members, depending on their context. A concrete example of this is our ELTA in Honduras, ELTA TISOL. Dr. D.L. White uh, from, from Australia, who lives in Peru, he says, excellent thoughts and presentation. We need more teachers and less politicians making decisions regarding. Jovo, uh, OK, thank you so much. Now uh, we have some minutes for the people who are present here and wants to express their opinions and ideas. First, I would like to listen to our president, Raj Gill in Canada. Thank you, Raj, for being present every Sunday. Raj. Uh, Jaime, thank you for the opportunity to uh, make some comments. I appreciate all of the comments that have been made and uh, sort of discouraged by the impact of colonization still on the teaching of the English language. Like how can we move past those whole colonization and the impact of colonization? How language is, is being taught still under the influence of all of that. So I think that was quite highlighted by the presenters and appreciate uh, being with you this morning. Thank you. Thank you so much, dear um, Raj. Anybody who wants to express his or her opinion briefly? Yeah, Fillmore Murillo. Where are you from, Fillmore? Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning there, I think. Good evening here. I am from the Philippines. I'm really oh, happy to listen. Oh, from the Philippines. Yes. Thank you so much. The first time I'm we really have happy to the Philippines. Yes. <laughs> I'm really happy. I'm really happy to listen to the perspective as far as teaching and learning from Colombia. I actually understand earlier the sentiment of Angelica when she talks about her frustrations in in organizations uh, not providing con contextualized topics or themes, and I believe that this is the role of universities to provide uh, conferences, seminars, and trainings that will directly address the needs of teachers, especially, especially that uh, they have the research capability in pinpointing what exactly is needed by the teachers along contextualizing and um, including the cultural aspects of a particular country. So I believe that universities should play that very important role in making sure that we don't just teach English, but we teach um, culture so that our students will be developed holistically. Thank you very much, and thank you for allowing me to join this event tonight. Oh, thank you, dear Fillmore. We feel honored to have somebody from the Philippines. Hope to see you more often in our uh, Sunday um, meetings. Luz Angela Roballo. Luz Angela uh, Roballo. Yes. Good morning to everyone. You don't have a camera, Luz Angela. Uh, no, not at the moment. Uh, my connection is not that well. OK, so, where are you I'm from, so Luz Angela? Where are you from? Um, I'm in, in Cali in this moment. Okay, and well, I'm uh, a teacher in a public school and I really appreciate what you said about this. And um, I have to say that um, as teachers, we have to talk about emotions as well because um, our students are dealing with so many things at the same time in this moment. And English can be just a source of changing uh, their motivation to study and their motivation to see another type of things. 
in Cali, I have to fight in my school, in my public school, what I'm, you know, I work with. Um, I have to deal with um, these type of issues and the context, the mm -hmm. violin, uh, the violence they, they have to deal with um, every single day. So English is like the opportunity to see another type of things and, and, uh, and open like another door. I, I have an English club in my school and uh, they, they feel really um, different in this space that I create with them some years ago. So um, I, I create that, that emotional place related to English. So it's kind of the, the opportunity to talk about how they feel, how, how they see English in the world. It's not just the Colombian context, but an international one. So it's, it's like to, um, to guide them in a different way. So, but in, in any case, it's not just the academic stuff and, and the grammar and all these type of things. And we have to, we have to give them meaningful classes, as you said before. So I really appreciate the ideas that I, that I got from here, but um, we have to take uh, the emotional part as well. Yes, dear Luz Angela, you are right. And thank you for your um, points of view. Okay, is there anybody else from any other country or institution who wants to speak and say something? Jaime, could I say something? Uh, Lord, Lord Arthur Field, welcome. <laughs> no, no, Lord, sorry. <laughs> no, uh, forgive me for my voice, but yesterday my son got married, so we were in a... Congratulations. Uh, well, well, welcome to the club. Yes, sir. <laughs> Thank you. No, uh, as, I, as I always say, I think uh, associations are a very important part of our profession. And I think that we have to really work hard on them. And as I always tell you, Jaime, you have taken the right steps to try to get people together from all around Latin America. I think it's time to, to get together and start something bigger. And also because the Philippines, and also the yes, Philippines, yes, and Canada. Yes. And we share similar problems. Yes. We share similar problems. So I think it's about time, Jaime. You, you are a great leader, and I think that you're taking the right steps. And if Europe was able to get together, and uh, why not us, no? I think that we have to strengthen our associations and work really hard towards that goal. That's my modest opinion. E, nada, we share the same, the same problems. And uh, Colombia is a beautiful country I really love and I've been there three times. So I think it's a great place. And yeah. thank you Colombian teachers no. for your, for your um, opinions and telling us about your, your problems in your country. That's yeah, it. Thank you. Thank you, dear Lord Arthur Field. Thank you for proposing me for to start this. Uh, yeah, who, who, who knows? We can start maybe, as we have been talking, the first international global association. Yes. I don't know. Yes. Something we can do. Mm -hmm. Yes. And in different countries. Yeah, we definitely. Yes. Different and every countries. year, and every year, you and me will travel the world giving uh, <laughs> workshops Why in not, different sir? countries. Why not? Why not? Why not? Why not? Anybody else, please, who wants to express his or her opinion in this beautiful morning, raise your hand. No one else? I can't I believe again. <laughs> Hello, Cesar Murillo. Where are you from? Uh, I am from Medellin, Colombia, and I would like to say that nowadays in our schools, we are trying to implement the project uh, based learning and teaching and um, maybe when we think in a, in an ideal classroom we could say that this is uh, wonderful however when implementing such a um, method or approach I, I don't know how to say or what it is called uh, we can find also like different difficulties to implement it so we have to bear in mind that we need uh, enough resources, enough materials uh, to carry out this kind of methods or, in, or active methods in our classrooms. Uh, we, I, for, for instance, these days, I have noticed that when we want to implement this approach, we maybe it could be useful to have only one project for the whole school because this way we can have like a, a huger impact, or like a bigger impact in what we are trying to do. For instance, in one grade, we are trying to implement a recycling project, but we have noticed that it's not maybe 
can I how can I say it doesn't have like the same effect because for example, sixth graders are working on saving energy, seventh graders are working on recycling. So I would propose to have like only one project for the whole school. But another mistake we have made is that uh, we are not uh, taking like as a departure point like the, the students' interests. We are taking into account our own interests like teachers. So if you are thinking about implementing this kind of uh, approaches, but basically it's like a transformation of the curriculum that the governments want to, uh, to carry out. I mean, uh, specifically Medellin, it's like a transformation of the teaching processes that the local government uh, uh, want to uh, implement. And I noticed that maybe they are thinking about ideal classrooms and they are not, thinking about the context, contextual uh, difficulties we can find. So it's very nice when we talk about meaningful learning, meaningful teaching, but we don't take into account the context. Thank you. No, thank you, dear Cesar Murillo, for giving us an outlook of what's going on in, in your country and in Medellin. Okay, a little bit to summarize, how would you describe the reality of the teaching learning process in Colombia? Well, it's the same in all, as I said before, in most of the countries in, in, in Latin America, what are the principal challenges of the teachers to become professionals? Here, I want to highlight something that is, if you want to be a good teacher, it doesn't matter, well, that is my personal point of view. It doesn't matter what the government does, it doesn't matter uh, the, 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 the business of the international exams, it doesn't matter, uh, it doesn't matter anything as long as you want to be the best teacher in class. If you want to be the teacher that you would like to have, you can forget all the problems. I know that is difficult, I know. But if you have chosen this uh, career, this profession, you must do, sorry, we must do it. We have to do it the best way we can. Okay, problems, uh, what, what to do to become a licenciado in lengua inglesa, we have heard, we have listened to you. And what are the English teachers associations? Well, most of you have already talked about this. And I read in Facebook Live that uh, these associations have to listen to the members of the groups. Okay, is there anybody else who wants to talk or, and, or if not, we will give the chance of, to Angelica, Mauricio, Jose, and Ulysses to say their final words today in this presentation. Anybody else wants to talk? Ah, yes, Marco Antonio Aparicio in Mexico. Number one, Marco, we are so sorry for the two earthquakes you have suffered recently. And I hope uh, most of the, your family and people are all right. Marco. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Not much problem here around in Puebla, but in other places there were many problems. Well, uh, I my, my comment uh, is about what you have just said in relation to the fact that if we want to be uh, good, uh, well, language teachers, we have to have that idea uh, idea clearly in mind and do everything <clears throat> we have to do, I would say, right? right. Uh, I was thinking about uh, what Mauricio, I think it was Mauricio, what Mauricio said uh, in relation to uh, working with content-based teaching. Uh, that um, uh, way of teaching English, uh, has been discussed for many, many years since the last century, right? But um, apparently still many teachers are very concentrated on teaching grammar. Uh, many things have changed about that. For example, in books, uh, we can observe that, uh, English teaching books, uh, we can observe that in every unit, the authors uh, give, uh, try to give information about different topics, the real real world topics, right? But what if we base more classes on more 
experiential facts, uh, contextually experiential facts. I mean, more experiential facts uh, uh, of uh, topics of, uh, of situations around us, for example, to not to uh, always be teaching grammar only, not for so always speaking about other interesting facts about other countries, but what, what uh, if we speak uh, or, and practice English to, to learn English about uh, uh, speaking about uh, situations that happen around us in our cities. And for example, here in Mexican families, Colombian families, or several many situations that may be interesting uh, to students, to teachers, to schools, to uh, in educational context. I mean, I just want to emphasize on uh, that idea because uh, that may help us to become better teachers, uh, like you said. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your wonderful opinion and participation. Before we go to the final words today of our guest speakers, uh, Debra Suarez in the USA, she says, as teacher educators and language professionals, we need to, to listen to our teachers in the classroom and to our professionals in the field. Uh, then uh, Gracia Maria Mendoza says, social emotional learning so relevant to us. Ilka Guzman in Ecuador, the union of ideas facing, dealing and supporting ourselves for the same goals regarding teaching and learning English could be an unstoppable movement for the better of our students, teachers in service and future teachers. Uh, uh, David White from Australia in Peru, he says, part of the problem is that we don't emphasize the importance of English, either with teachers or students, we treat it more uh, as just being a basic subject than as a tool for changing students' lives. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, so now the final uh, words today, dear Mauricio, Angelica, Jose, and uh, uh, Ulises. We are going to start with you, Ulises, then Jose, uh, uh, then uh, Angelica, and at the end, at the last but not the least, Mauricio, Mauricio Arango, uh, Ulises. Okay, I just want to say that <clears throat> I am happy you you have me here and invited uh, because um, it's a, an opportunity to join not only uh, a topic I love, but also a reflection opportunity. Then I would highlight three main reasons why uh, new teachers need to reflect upon what the responsibility of being a teacher is. It is, as Marco was mentioning, not only talking about academic skills, but also remember you are teaching a human being. And a human being is learning about culture, learning about how to be, learning about how to take the bath, but also learning how, how to respect and, and value what his or her country is. Secondly, remember that the government is, is, is attached or is referring all the laws according to what, um, uh, let's say, an economical power is suggesting them to do. Then um, sometimes uh, we don't need to worry about or about all what the law says we got to do, but we got to do our part to be uh, um, excellent teachers or at least have the performance that is necessary to become a teacher everywhere. Thank, thank you. Ah, sorry, sorry. Yeah, sorry. sorry. And just in addition, I would say assume the responsibilities uh, uh, being a teacher with uh, with passion, love, and not only thinking about how much money you will earn at the end of the month. And basically, uh, try to reflect about your classroom, the way you plan in the lessons, the way you deliver the lessons, and also try to start reading more about what other teachers are doing. It would be within your country and outside your country, then you compare and you need to come out with your, your own credo, uh, credo of teaching, which is amazing. Um, and finally, I would say, remember that the students you will have today 
are not the same the students uh, I may have or the ones uh, I was when I was in the undergraduate program. They are students who has um, uh, great power of technology, great uh, greater skills of technology, and they are creative, critical, and the most important. They are not emotional safe, but you need to, to show them that how to have and develop that inner motivation. And thank you once more time to let me this possibility of meeting my dear friends from Colombia. Okay. Thank you, dear Ulises, and keep on enjoying your stay in, in the USA. Jose Lobo. Thank you for this great opportunity, Jaime. Um, I want to also thank all the participants, all the people who attended, you know, this, this, this presentation. Um, if I offended anyone here, um, forgive me. Um, it was not my intention to, you know, but the one thing that we need to really uh, work towards is uh, teaching quality, uh, treating people um, in a human way. Um, one thing that I do, one thing that I do with Professor Alida Vizcaino at the Atlantico University, that's where we work, we create every year project fairs. And in these project fairs, uh, we, we, we focus on four things, the four C's. Um, the four C's are communication, cooperation, critical thinking, and creating and innovating. Um, we, we, we focus on one issue, and that issue is freedom. Give students freedom. And I work at a low-income university. 80% of my students, of our students, don't have money. They come from very, very, very low income communities, very low income communities. And, um, and we have problems with funding. We have problems with materials. Um, we have local problems at the university. We have government problems, you know, in general, but we always try to manage. We always try to find uh, help from different people like uh, the Global Community United for Equity in the United States. Professor Marianne Olding, Professor Jose Ricardo, which you guys have seen before, um, Professor Lydia Rodriguez at Indiana State University, and uh, Professor Shirley Finlater in the United States, and I'm sorry, in London um, and, and in Bristol. So we always have to fight back. Teachers, we teachers, professors, teachers, instructors, we cannot wait for everything to happen. We have to make things happen. Thank you. Thank you, dear Jose Lobo and God willing, see you next year in Colombia when I visit your city. Yes, sir. We have to see. We have to we have to we have to we have to uh, see each other either in Peru or in Colombia. Well or first anywhere we'll be, in the world. Yes, but first will be Colombia. Tu casa es mi casa. <laughs> okay, uh, Angelica Rojas, your final words today in this presentation. Okay, thank you, Jaime, and thank you, my partners, for being here. Thank you, Jaime, for inviting me to these wonderful meetings. I've always followed you, and, and I'm an admirer of your work and your tenacity of everything you do. Uh, thank you for everything. Thank you for being such a wonderful human being. You're like a brother to me and to many of us, I know. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, dear Angelica, because uh, you were our, our savior, because just this week you learned that you were going to be here. So thank you so much, sister. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, thank you, my Jaime. Okay, uh, in general terms, we should always know that we teachers are motivators and we are very, good at being challenged. So we accept challenges and we know how to deal with them. And we come up with wonderful ideas right in the last minute and that is amazing. So we are wonderful human beings. And as my partner said, we know that we're dealing with humans and we are trying to humanize education in Colombia, which is something I love about my partners. So we should see English as a transversal subject. English is not the base subject or, or, or of any school in Colombia it should be seen as a transversal subject. So using project-based learning and content-based learning or teaching are 
excellent ways to see English as such, as a transversal language. And we should also, in our classes, uh, we should refer to the local language and the local culture mainly at, uh, like in the first place before the second culture or the other, or the, uh, other culture. And remember that English is just a tool. English is just a language. It's another language. As other professors were saying, there are many languages in the world and we Colombians are already bilingual. We are multilingual. We have wonderful languages. We have local languages. We have indigenous languages and we have a lot of, uh, of uh, intercultural diversity here in Colombia. So we should see English just as a language, that's it. It's just another language and it's a wonderful language. Yes, of course, but it's, it's even easier to learn than any other languages like Arabic or even Spanish. So thank you very much everybody for listening to us. Us, and thank you, Jaime, again for having me. Thank you, dear Angelica, and see you in Colombia too soon next year. Okay. And, okay, and before we go on with uh, the next president of the next English Teachers Association in Colombia, Mauricio Arango. Uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> or, remember, Jaime, you, you made me go to Spain to visit my family and present at <laughs> the conference when we met there in Caquetá. Anyway, well, you, 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 you just have said something that is connected to what I'm going to say. Debra Suarez wrote in Facebook Live something that I always mention. Be a teacher with passion and love. That's it. Hmm. If you are passionate, you don't need a good salary. You don't need excellent uh, work conditions. You don't need a wonderful government. You don't need wonderful policies because you are passionate. So you, you, you will just teach because you love what you do. And love, if you have love, you will love your students. You will love, you will treat them as the human beings they are. Because you are a master, a doctor, I always say that, you are not better than the students. You are just a human being teaching another human being. You are not superior, we are not superior, they are not inferior. Doesn't matter, public school, uh, private school, university, institute, whatever. So thank you, Debra, for reminding yeah. me about that. So Dr. Mauricio Arango, I'm not. <laughs> next okay, president I mean. of the uh, next- Let me finish by saying something that, uh, I mean, actually I live in Medellin and I, really aware of the situation we live in the city with violence and as also Los Angeles, the professor Los Angeles said about with mental issues about our students. But I want to share with you something that is not part of formal, it's not a formal research, but it's based on what I have seen in my city and talk to some teachers and maybe it, it doesn't apply to Cesar. Anyways, but I, I wanna say that I know many teachers are motivated to teach English. So yes. we keep saying, we keep saying that students need to be motivated. Are we motivated to go to class tomorrow and teach at 7 a.m.? I mean, this is one question you know, to reflect. Second, selfish. Before the pandemic, most of my friends, colleagues some that I know were selfish. During the pandemic, I say, oh my goodness, that's the time we are going to stop being selfish. Now we are kind of over and we are still selfish. What is the thing? That uh, when I spend one weekend creating an activity, how come am I gonna share this with Jaime? Jaime was having fun with, with his great uh, grandson. And how I'm gonna share this with Jaime? How I can make Jaime life easier if he didn't spend a lot of time like I did. So one thing that I, we need to share with our colleagues, some uh, successful teacher teaching practices that have been working in our classes. And uh, the last thing is that uh, now, it's something that I want to share with you. It's so personal now that uh, in the past I observed some teachers in Colombia, but it was by the Ministry of Education. Now I decided to start a very own project that I'm going to see to observe classes to some of my friends in Colombia. I began in Cartagena, now I'm in Buga. I'm going to be in Buga for a week observing friends' classes with elementary school students. So let's see how different it is to observe teachers that are at the, under pressure and how is observed teachers that are accepted. But it's not because I was sent by the Ministry of Education, it's because me, maybe a friend of them, is going to observe the classes, provide some feedback, and I'm also going to learn. So maybe next time it's gonna be Barranquilla. So I began Cartagena, now Buga, and next is Barranquilla. 
So oh. this is something that I, I want to share with you. Okay, thank you so much, you four and everyone who has been present here. And uh, next next week, next Sunday, we have elections here in Peru to elect new majors for our city halls and governors for our uh, cities. But anyway, we will have the round table with our friends and colleagues from Guatemala. So hope to see you there. Thank you very much. As usual, I have to cook and do the washing up. I don't know about you. <laughs> I'll see you next Sunday. Thank you so much. Goodbye, everyone. Bye-bye. 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 Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.